So welcome back to Ephesians. If you are just joining us this morning for the first time, you're coming in at a good time because we're still on chapter one. If you are struggling at all with the transition between Samuel and Ephesians, uh, going from a narrative to a discourse, I really do understand that. It can be a little bit like whiplash going from this really interesting story uh, to what is really pure doctrine. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a transition. Of course, they are both important. God speaks through them both. We need both. And I just want to encourage you to keep going. This week was probably easier than last. Uh, and as we continue on, the Lord will help us. He will grant us that understanding and wisdom that Paul talks about and prays for, for the Ephesians. I am praying as well for all of us uh, that the Lord would grant us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and of knowledge in him. Uh, I love Ephesians. It's like music to me. I think it sings as I read it. It sings. It's like doctrine being played out in a symphony. It's an incredible combination of sort of poetic form and doctrine. Truth about who God is, but beautifully, poetically communicated. The first half of chapter one is praise, blessing God for the ways uh, in which he has blessed us in Christ. It's this big circle of blessing. What comes from God must go back to him. Paul is blessing God because he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Uh, Paul uses that phrase in Christ or in him or in the beloved, all meaning the same thing, meaning in Christ, 11 times in 14 verses. That is a significant amount of repetition, which of course is Paul's way, uh, God's way of highlighting its essentialness, highlighting Christ as the foundation of the church from eternity past. I think Ephesians uh, 1, 6 captures the spirit of that circle of blessing pretty well. It says, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So the praise of his glorious grace going from Paul to God, praising God for the blessings with which God has blessed us in Christ, in the beloved. I love it written as in the beloved. Uh, it's like this endearing, sweet Bible nickname for Jesus. He is the beloved, beloved of the Father from eternity past and beloved by us as well. Uh, I happen to love the way the King James Version says it. It says, to the praise of his glorious grace, wherein he hath uh, made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. Uh, that's what so much of this whole first half of chapter one is really saying, that we are accepted in the beloved. It's a glorious thought, isn't it? that no matter what is going on in your life, in your body, in the world, in the universe, you are accepted in the beloved. If you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are accepted in the beloved. You may not feel that way all the time, but we do not need to live as victims of our feelings. I don't know about you, Maybe your emotions are more stable than mine. Uh, I can tell you that mine are constantly in flux, constantly in motion, ebbing and flowing and jumping up and down and turning sideways. Some days when we have been very disciplined in our Bible reading and our prayer life is more vital and we seem to have better control over our annoyances and irritability, we're just kind of holding it together better than we do at other times. In those days, we don't really have so much trouble believing that we are accepted in the beloved. We can actually imagine that we are up 
objects of divine love, we feel more accepted in the beloved. But then there are other days when our spirits are not quite so high, when our prayer life has been erratic in our Bible reading, maybe not so deep and not so frequent, and maybe our tempers fly a little more than we would like, and then we don't feel quite so accepted in the beloved. And sometimes in those moments, we question, is God really with me? Is he really for me? Am I really even a Christian? Am I accepted in the beloved? You know, we loom pretty large in our own minds, <laughs> I hate to say it, uh, but our behavior and our thoughts are so very, very significant to us. Uh, if we could only realize that our highs do not exalt us before the Father, and our lows do not make us less in the Father's sight. Because we sit and stand and breathe and move and have our being in Him, in Him, in the Beloved, the one who is constantly the Beloved of God. There is no fluctuation in Him. We stand in Him. And if your life and your trust for your life and your salvation is in Jesus Christ, then you are accepted in the beloved, the sinless, spotless one who sits at the right hand of the Father, sitting not because he's tired and taking a well-deserved break. He sits because his work of redemption is accomplished. He sits not to rest, but to reign. And he is doing the work of reigning even now with the immeasurable power of his greatness. And with that backdrop, Jesus reigning as king of kings in the heavenly places, we come to the second half of Ephesians 1. Verse 15 begins with, for this reason. Meaning, for everything previously stated in this letter, for this reason. So I am going to go through a laundry list of everything that he has stated. So please bear with me. It will take me a minute, but follow along with me as I do this. These are the reasons. So because he has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing, because he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. Because he has predestined us in love to be adopted as his children. Because we have redemption through his blood. Because he has forgiven our trespasses. Because he has lavished his grace upon us in all wisdom and insight because he has made known the mystery of his will, meaning that he has revealed what had previously been hidden, because he has a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth, because we have an inheritance, because we live to the praise of his glory, because when we believed in him, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, which we will for the praise of his glory. For these reasons, in light of everything we have been given in Christ, this marvelous inher inheritance, Paul then intercedes in prayer for those who possess this treasure. I wonder if you think of yourself as a person who possesses a great treasure. If you are in Christ, you certainly possess the greatest treasure that the world could ever know. Because of this treasure, Paul prays. It had been about four years since Paul had ministered there in Ephesus. And now he is in prison, uh, but he had heard from and about the Ephesians, and he heard two things in particular about them that confirmed to them 
to him that their salvation was genuine. He had heard of their faith in Christ and their love for other Christians. Now, the New Testament does not separate Jesus as Savior from Jesus as Lord. When he becomes your Savior, he becomes your Lord. He is both Lord and Savior, or he is neither. Paul says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He had heard of their faith in Christ in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now that faith had blossomed into love, which is the second mark of a genuine <laughs> Christian. Love for all the saints. Notice that Paul does not say I noticed your love for some of the saints or most of the saints. He said all of the saints. Christ loves all the saints. They are precious in his sight. Therefore, if Christ loves them all, then we are to love them all as well. We can't really love the Lord Jesus without loving those whom he loves. Not just those with whom we have much in common, but all those whom Christ loves. Uh, I remember reading this example many years ago, and it has just stuck with me and stayed with me ever since. Picture the, uh, the, a wheel, right? maybe a big wagon wheel or a ship's wheel, and the hub of the wheel is in the middle. And as the spokes of the wheel grow closer to the hub, they come closer to one another as well. As we draw closer to the Lord, our hub, we grow closer to each other in love as well. Paul says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. He is thanking God for them all the time. He is praying for them with great regularity. And then in verse 17, the prayer begins. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, it had already been stated in verse 13 that when the Ephesians heard the gospel and believed in Christ, they were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So it's not that they did not have the Holy Spirit, they did have the Spirit. It is explicitly stated that they had the Holy Spirit, that he was there. But our reliance on him must be strengthened. We need to pray for the ministry of the illumination of the Holy Spirit as Paul prays, that God would grant wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. We need to wake up to his presence. Uh, in the rest of the chapter, Paul is praying for God to give believers true understanding and appreciation for who they are in Christ so that they could begin to have even a glimpse of how magnificent and how limitless the blessings are that already belong to us in Christ. It's like he is just trying to wake them up, shake them a little, and wake us up as well to all that Christ has done for us, all that he is to us, all that we have in him. Jesus has done all of this, everything stated from verse 3 to verse 14, and some of it happened even before the world was formed. And then, of course, Christ came to this earth, and he was crucified, and he died, and he rose. Jesus finished the work of redemption on the cross, but it's not like ever since then he's been twiddling his thumbs up in heaven. He is always working on our behalf with the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. Jesus is using the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us. Now this prayer is directed toward the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, linking God the Father to Christ the Son, the one to whom all glory belongs is the same essence as the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the second time in this paragraph Jesus is referred, referred
referred to as Lord. Paul is trying to spare these people from frantically searching for what is already theirs. He wants them to see God as the source of everything that they could ever possibly ever need in this life and in the one to come. I recently read uh, a little story about William Randolph Hearst. Uh, maybe you remember who he was. He was a newspaper uh, developer. He developed the largest newspaper chain in the United States and sort of uh, introduced and popularized sensationalism to American culture. Thank you very much, Mr. Hearst. Uh, but here's the story. He once read about an extremely valuable piece of art, uh, which he decided he just absolutely had to have to add to his collection. So he had his agent scour the world looking for this piece and spent months and a great deal of money doing so. He was ready to pay any price for this work of art, only to find out that the piece already belonged to him. It was found in one of the warehouses where it had been stored for many years. You know, in a similar way, it is so sad that believers sometimes set out on a quest for something more in the Christian life. Something extra, something shiny, something that every other Christian maybe doesn't have, something special, something new. More of Jesus, more of the Spirit, more manifestations of Him, as if He were being dealt out in a card game. When we were saved, Christ gave us all of himself. He did not withhold certain things to be parceled out later for good behavior. We seek to know him better, yes, of course. We pray for the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, absolutely. We long to have a deeper, more whole understanding of him, to see him better, to see his glory and relish in it. But 2 Peter 1, 3 says, His divine power has granted to us everything to life, everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and excellence. He has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. We are accepted in the beloved. It's mind-blowing, isn't it? Paul is trying to keep them from expending their energies looking for blessings that are already theirs. And I think we need to let this impact the way that we pray. I think we need to pray, as Paul did, to wake us up to what the Lord has already done for us. So why do I so often pray for strength? And I do. When Philippians 4 tells me that God has said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Sometimes I pray for greater love, to love people that I find slightly more challenging to love. But Paul says that God's own love has been poured out within my heart through the Holy Spirit. I pray for grace, forgetting that the Lord has said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, I am not saying, not at all, that it's wrong to pray for strength and grace and love. Please don't misunderstand me. I just realize that when I'm praying it, it's, the problem is with me. If there is a deficit in any of those things, it is not because the Lord has not generously given them to me already. I am just not utilizing what he has already given me. For whatever reason, I have decided not to hold fast to the strength, love, and grace that he has already provided. God has not been stingy. 
He tells us that he will, that we will rise up like eagles and renew our strength. If I'm short on any of those graces, it's because I have not searched the warehouses of the grace that God has already bestowed upon me. Verse 18 says, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. In the Hebrew world, the heart was considered the center of a person's being, the whole inward self, the mind, as well as the will, the center of reason. It was not just emotions. That was considered coming more from the gut. The eyes of the heart are the inner eyes which need to be opened or enlightened before we can begin to grasp God's grace and goodness, that you may know the hope to which he has called you. So what has God called us to he has called us to something and for something. If you were with us last year in our study of Exodus, maybe, maybe you remember me saying about 150,000 times that the Israelites are being called from something for something, from slavery to worship. We are being called to something. We, he has called us to belong to Jesus Christ. He has called us into the fellowship of, of Jesus Christ, a call to an altogether new life in which we know, love, and obey, and serve the risen Christ, that we look past beyond our present suffering to the glory that will be revealed. This is the hope to which he has called us. Paul wants them to know, and he wants us to know, that you were not an afterthought. You were not God's plan B. You were on God's mind before the earth was formed. He loved you before the foundations of the earth. And Paul prays that our eyes may be opened to know that we would know the extent of the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus, the riches of his glorious inheritance. Verse 19 says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? The power is for those who believe. That's for Christians. That's us. That power is for us. The immeasurable greatness or, or the surpassing greatness, as some translations uh, say, of his power is given to every Christian. When we are saved, we receive all of God's grace and all his power. Paul did not pray for more power to be given to believers. He prayed that they be given a divine awareness of the power that they already possessed in Christ. Philippians 2, 3 says, it is God who is at work at you in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. When Paul talked about his many afflictions that he had suffered in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he said, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Now, there are times when we all wonder whether God can do a certain thing in us or through us. But when we look at what he accomplished in Christ, that he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, that same power that raised Jesus is also the power that is at work in us. That is unbelievable. That same unlimited divine power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in you and will raise you from the dead as well. And that same power that seated him at the Father's right hand will seat us right there with him. That is some unbelievable, amazing power. And I need to use it so much better you know, this may seem like a little bit of a side note, and I, I promise I'm going somewhere with it. I, I have a fairly packed closet. Um, I would be actually a little embarrassed if you were to see it, because it's all very squished in there. 
I really don't need any more clothes. Please don't tell my husband I said that. <laughs> I just need to better utilize what I already have. And I suspect that we all have to better utilize the power, the strength, the love, the graces that we have already been given. When Timothy was criticized by other Christians, he understandably got discouraged. This is what Paul said to him in response. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Basically, he's saying, remember the greatness of the person who lives inside you. Every single one of us needs to keep that as our focus all of the time. Remember the greatness of the person who lives inside you. This passage ends with God giving a description of Christ in verse 22. Him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. You see the closeness of the bond there in that description. He is the head. We are the body. This expresses the unfathomable, inseparable bond relationship between Christ and his church. I mean, would Christ want to be a head without a body? I don't, I don't think so. The church is Christ's body. He is organically united with the church. He loves the body so much that he exercises his infinite power, the immeasurable greatness of his power on her behalf. So if you are discouraged as Timothy was, if you are tired or weak or sick or stressed or whatever else you may be, remember the greatness of the person who lives inside you. And then go home and ask the Lord to wake you up to the immeasurable greatness of his power. Father, we praise you. We thank you for Jesus. Where would we be without him? I don't want to think about it. We praise you that you have blessed us in him, in the beloved, that we are accepted in the beloved with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That there is nothing that we, that we need that we do not have, that you have given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Help us to remember the immeasurable greatness of your power at work in us who believe. And wake us up Help us to remember the greatness of the person who dwells within us. In his name, we praise you. Amen.